Lift your head, weary sinner. The river's just ahead. Down the path to forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You build a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. And your lost and wandering comes stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. If you strayed and walked away, unspeakable things you've done. Fix your eyes on the mountain, let the past be dead and gone. Come on, you saints and sinners, you can't outrun God. Whatever you've done, you can't overcome the power of the blood. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. Wrecked again, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. The chains fall, let the chains fall, let the chains fall. If you're lost and wondering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and wondering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. The gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. Amen. Good morning. I'm Reverend Alexis. I'm the pastor here at Broadway United Methodist Church. It is so good to be here worshiping this morning. A couple of words of announcement about our schedule throughout the rest of the week. Today, tonight at six o'clock, we have student life. So if you have a middle school or high school student, sorry, one of those was my kid coming barreling through. Uh, if you have a middle school or high school student who's interested in talking more about spirituality or the Bible in a place with open and unconditional acceptance, Tonight is the night to come and to check that out with Mr. Shane Coffey here in this place. Monday morning from 9 to noon, the Aldersgate Circuit will be gathered here. That is a group of pastors that serve the Council Bluffs area, although we also have a layperson from Shelby United Methodist Church and a pastor from all the way down in Shenandoah that will be joining us. Uh, it's our first circuit meeting of the year, and I, I promise you we've got Miss Shannon Meister as our circuit lay leader. So she keeps us from... Um, she keeps us from, from getting too much of a ruckus. From 12 to 2, Phillips Cupboard is open. And at 7.30 p.m., Bible at Barley's is over at Barley's back in the tap room. Tuesday at 6.30, we have Reverend Rebecca Simon Peter here. She is um, an expert in helping churches see revitalization, and she's offering us a workshop to help us figure out how to do, dream about how to do ministry together in the post-pandemic world. You are all welcome to come to that, and we'll also be live streaming from our Facebook page. On Wednesday, we have the last, I think it's the last picnic and praise. Carrie, is it our last... 
Miss Carrie. She's talking to my kid. All right, we have a picnic and praise at six o'clock at Big Lake Park. Um, if you are, it's our last picnic and praise at Big Lake Park. Just a reminder, if at three o'clock that day, it's 100 degrees or more, or it's raining, the event will move to Fellowship Hall here in the church. So we encourage you to be part of that. And then at 6.30, the praise band will be practicing here. On Thursday from 12 to one, we have the men's brown bag study where we're talking about the Bible year. We encourage you to come to that. It's been a lot of fun. And on Friday, the office is closed closed, but Phillip's cupboard is open from 12 to 2, so if you want to volunteer or just be a part of that, uh, we would love to have you there. On Saturday, from 9 a.m. to 12.30, the staff will be here on a retreat. As you might imagine, we have staff that work full-time outside of the church, and so it's been a challenge to find ways and places for us to get together, but we want to make sure we're ready for fall. And so we're going to gather, give up some of our weekend to gather together and get our plans all in order and be ready to go as we roll into fall. Uh, you may have noticed that the staff Bible study dropped off the calendar. It's because we're having trouble getting everyone there on Monday nights. So what we're going to do on this Saturday is look for a Sunday when we can all get together and have lunch once a month. So that'll be the new plan for the staff connection moving forward. Uh, if you could be in prayer for us, that would be wonderful. We covet your prayers of support as we um, look for these opportunities to get together. I encourage you to be picking up and reading your newsletter. There is so much happening in September and October, you are not gonna wanna miss it. Uh, September may even be a really great month if you normally join us online. If you are able to join us in person in September, we're gonna be celebrating something every single Sunday in September. It's gonna be so much fun to be here. There's gonna be so much happening. And then in October, on the fifth Sunday in October, we're gonna be celebrating again the completion of a campaign that we'll tell you about in a little that we'll tell you about throughout the months of September and October with a guest speaker we'll all be together at 9 30 and it's just going to be a blast so the fall is going to be a lot of fun around here we're excited and we're excited to see some of our school year programming restart Whew, okay let's pray God we thank you that you have called us to this place that there is this place to gather and to worship, whether this place is here in person or online, we thank you that you are here with us, that you make it possible for us to be present with one another and to experience your presence with us. We ask that this time would be a blessing to you, and we ask God that our hearts and minds would be open and ready to receive whatever you have for us today, that we trust that you have something for each of us today, a nudge, a word of comfort, a teaching. You have something for each of us, so help our hearts and minds be open to receive what you have for us today and to be transformed by our time together. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and join our praise band in singing.
that you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are that is who you are that is who you are even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop Jesus you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are that is invite you to be seated and we turn the worship over to Miss Carrie and her youngest disciples. Good morning. How are you all? Good. Good. How are you? Good. Good. I feel like a sandwich here. I have kids on both sides of me. Um, did you, oh, I forgot we had talked about at first service. Um, are you ready to go back to school? Yes. Are you yes. ready? Yes, 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 yes. Are you ready? Yes. It's funny because the older kids. No. I, I knew it. <laughs> the older kids are not ready, but the little kids are ready, and I'm sure the parents are ready. Yeah, my mom is. Like your mom is. <laughs> Oh, you have something planned before you go back to school. Something fun? Oh, good. That is good. Um, the last service we talked about new shoes and how Nehemiah's shoes matches his glasses, right? And Marley and I both wore pink today. And you have cowboy boots on, which I think are adorable. Cowgirl, sorry, cowgirl boots, sorry. What's up with you? Oh, and you have your sparkly shoes on. Yeah, because... You're kind of a princess, right? <laughs> you are. Um, did you know, and I know you two already know the answer to this, that today is Friendship Day. Did you know that? Friendship You did know? No. <laughs> Seriously, did you know that, Serenity? Today is Friendship Day? Yeah, it's on, the cal it's on my calendar, so I figure it's, it has to be real, right? If it's on a calendar. And I Googled it, too, just to make sure that it was really, truly Friendship Day. But why do, why do you like friends? Why do you have... They're nice and helpful. Why do you have friends? Be because they help you do hmm? stuff. Company? Good. Because, you, because they help you do stuff. Right. Why do you have friends? Because they're nice people. Because they're nice people, right? Like, your friends support you, right? And, and, and um... And friends help you clean up your mess. <laughs> they help you clean up your mess. <laughs> Very good. I need some more friends then, because I need some help with that. Will you be my friend? Yes. Oh, good. Because we're all friends up here, right? We're all friends? Yeah? I know I'm a lot older than you, but I'm still your friend, right? Yeah. Right. And the last friend that's with all of us is God. Right. You just you just stole the next thing I was going to say. God is the best friend ever. Right. God is the best friend ever and he's always going to be your friend, right? No matter how mad you make him or how sad you make him, he's always going to be your friend. Right? Through good, bad, ugly, when you're young, when you're old, forever. He's like a built-in best friend, kind of like a brother or sister. I always feel like your brother or sister are built-in best friend. I don't oh, want a brother. 
Well, no, your sister. I know he has a sister, my goodness. Um, so we remember that. Like when you're heading off to school, you're going to make new friends, right? As you um, get into your classrooms and stuff, which will be a lot of fun because you'll make new friends, right? You'll have new people in your class. But always remember that God's your number one friend, right? Okay, shh, not now. Not right now. All right, should we pray and go downstairs for some Sunday school stuff? Do you want to pray? No, you don't want to? You should. Oh. Are, you, are you praying for us? Serenity, did you want to pray? No? Okay. Do you want, you want to pray for us? Yeah? Never, never pray. <laughs> Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for our people. Thank, thank you for our people. Thank you for our food. For, for our food. For our water. For our water. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Mm-mm. Wait. We have a special addition to our order of worship this morning. Um, you may not always see this man, but he makes it possible for us to be worship online. He's been running our camera through pandemic and helps us get out into the world. And he is going to college and wanted to share his testimony with us this morning. So. Uh, let us welcome up here Chris. Chris is going to tell a little bit of his story. Good morning. For those, <laughs> for those of you I haven't introduced myself to, my name is Chris. If you do know me, you probably recognize me as the guy who works magic behind the camera. Um, Today is an exciting and nerve-wracking kind of sad day for me, not just because I'm here with my family of Christ, but because I'm about to embark on a journey to the University of Nebraska and Lincoln for college in the upcoming week. So if I do get emotional, it's for good reason. Um, I'm here to, uh, talking to you instead of behind the camera because I wanted to start and I wanted to end and start my new journey in life by telling you what I've learned with just three main points in my life my life before I knew Christ, how I came to know Christ, and lastly, my life after I accepted him into my life. My life before I knew Christ, to tell you honestly, I n was never this active in church until high school, which is normally the opposite of what happens to teenagers. Growing up, uh, the church was always something my mom and always wanted my siblings and I to be a part of. I used to think church was something boring that mom drags their kids to, as childish as that sounds. <laughs> However, it, it was also because I couldn't find a church I considered home that I didn't like church. My mom, she found a church that she settled at because of a, I was involved in an after-school activity called the Good News Club at my old school. My mom, she found a place for her heart there and the beginning of her faith. However, it wasn't a place I felt welcomed. I am transgender and a member of the LGBTQ+, and this automatically made it very difficult for me to find a church I felt unconditionally accepted at. That was until I came to Broadway, and this time I made sure to drag my mom with. All it took was one service for me here at Broadway to feel truly the love of God I had been looking for. I walked through those doors and I saw smiles, laughter, acceptance. No one cared who you were or what you wore. All that mattered was you showed up. From that point on, I knew I found a place I could call my home away from home. I started going to youth group and the meetings and learned everything I could. And you guessed it, I dragged many of my friends who wanted to get out of their house to that too. Then I went to Summer Games Georgia in 2018. I can't express to anyone how much this one event changed my faith. Even through it, there was a huge group of kids. We all didn't know each other. We all just shared one thing in common, our faith. We all had so much fun just singing and praise and worship, growing close with God. However, it wasn't the fact that I was surrounded by believers that impacted me. It was all due to one story I remember to this day because it was what gave me my faith. The story goes, he, a man, he came on stage and he told us his story. I don't remember his name. However, I'll call him Sam for now. Sam explained that he had been looking for new ways to pray, so he picked up journaling. 
At the same time, he had got together with a beautiful, wise woman, and he wanted to marry her. But this would be his third marriage, and he was hesitant because he couldn't take the heartache. Sam ended up talking to a friend and told him his worries. Sam told him that God had a plan for everything, and all he had to do was just listen. As their chat ended, his friend said he would pray for a rainbow. Sam just looked at him dumbfounded. He, but he took his advice and decided to go backpacking in the mountains as one of his other hobbies he's done. As he looked at God's beautiful creations, you know, that one thought stuck in his mind, the rainbow his friend prayed for. He was so surprised by it and he thought, why not pray for a rainbow? What's the worst that could happen? He flipped open his journal and he wrote, God ask for your strength and wisdom. If you're here with me and always will be, give me a sign. Give me a rainbow. However, Sam didn't end his prayer there. He went on to write, Now if this is the woman I should spend the rest of my life with, give me a second rainbow and then I shall know. Sam waited and he kept watch for this rainbow everywhere he went. But after a few days, he saw no response and soon forgot about the whole ordeal. Once he got home, he unpacked, he sat down, closed his eyes, you know, relaxed. Sam, he, he jarred open his eyes for just one second and the light filled up the house and letting one rainbow straight through the curtains onto a mirror pointing directly at him. And he was just awestruck in that one pure second. Next thing you know, here comes another rainbow shooting across this piece of glass, shooting across this piece of glass. And next thing you know, the room is just filled with rainbows all across the room, confirming every single thing he asked for in just one second. The story amazed me and I began to pray for that rainbow that same time I heard that story. I asked God to give me a sign like he did Sam, but without saying the symbol, I thought of a baby white rabbit. No reason, just thought. <laughs> and just like Sam's story, I looked and looked and I saw no response to my prayer. I arrived back at Broadway after summer games. My grandmother picked me up and as we drove, we stopped at a gas station in the middle of town. The gas station was so busy and there was no forest, no bushes or anything green. I turned my head and just in this little tiny alleyway, one spot, I spot a baby white rabbit just sitting directly in the middle. It sat so perfectly still and just locked eyes with me. And to me, it felt like God was saying through the rabbit, I'm always here. And then the rabbit just hopped away, like nothing happened. All I could do was cry knowing I wasn't alone. God was always with me. And that day was the day I accepted Christ as my savior into life. That was the day my relationship started. And after accepting him into my life, it has been nothing but true bliss. I'd gone through being homeless, abuse, my family being torn apart. I felt like I hit rock bottom. But even with all those many horrible things happening in my life, I knew I wasn't alone. And it all happened for a reason. I gave others what I didn't have even at, the po at, even at that point in my life. I did all I could to give to others assistance because I knew I had God on my side. But many needed what I was blessed with. I've learned since that day God works in mysterious ways. like. Everyone's always told me. At times, I, it might not look like he is or he's helping you when he's, he's not helping you in hard times. This is why I'm glad I learned that it doesn't matter how bad or how good the time is in your life. God puts something or someone in your path to make you closer to him. God does this so he can get, so you can give someone that hope of tomorrow. More than anything, unconditional love is all we need to give. We don't need anger or sorrow knowing God is taking care of all, it all in his beautiful and mysterious ways. That's why today I want to leave you with this verse I've kept in my life ever since I can remember. It's from the book of James, chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all of the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accepted in the world planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, but also, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Thank you. We have an opportunity now at offering time to respond 
to this call that we've just heard from Chris to continue to be the church of unconditional love and acceptance. When we give our gifts, our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, we enable ministries like this to continue in this place. And so we will, um, I need a couple volunteers to pass out the offering baskets here in this place, but you can through text to give or through PayPal if you feel so led. And today we have a new song that we want to offer up to you that's joining our praise rotation. This is Graves into Gardens. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, never enough. You came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but you've seen them all. You still call me friend, because the God of the mountain is still the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn great into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways the only one who can you're the only one who can well, there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. The only one who can turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can you're the only one who can amen We've come to our time where we are going to step into a role of praying on behalf of ourselves and those around us on behalf of the world. And I have some prayer requests that I would like to share with you. So if you 
um, want to make notes about these and keep them with you throughout the week. We would love to have these prayers continue. Uh, first, we want to rejoice and also um, mourn and, and acknowledge the stress of all of our friends and family who are transitioning students, transitioning them into new schools, sending them off to college. Uh, our second child is heading into kindergarten this fall, which for those of you that have had a couple different children, you know the first child going to kindergarten is kind of sad, but the second child going, it's like, yes, go, go. So uh, super excited for him to go to kindergarten, but I recognize that we've got teachers that are getting ready to welcome new students, moving into classrooms, and the last couple years of teaching has been just impossibly hard. And so a lot of them are tired and burned out, and so we want to pray for our teachers as they get ready for, um, as they get ready for the fall and pray for our students as they head into the fall. We want to give thanks and also pray for the Petersons. We found out that they're, they're moving into Primrose. So if you've tried to call them, they're transitioning their telephone right now. And so we give thanks that they're able to do that, but they're still in the middle of their transition. We pray for um, Amanda's uncle. Amanda, you may have seen her sitting at our welcome desk between services. Her uncle Joe is in a coma and they are moving him to hospice soon. And so we wanna pray for uncle Joe and his family as they, as they walk this journey of grief and letting go. We pray for Gloria Gardner's sister-in-law. She's having her first chemo treatment coming up soon. And so we pray for healing on her body and wisdom and compassion from her doctors and nurses. We pray for Joyce Minster. Joyce is the organist for our first service and she broke her leg. So she is going to be out for a while. Um, Jan filled in this morning and did a beautiful job, uh, but you know we're, we're, we're still working on all the logistics of that, but we wanna pray for Joyce. If you know Joyce at all, you know that sitting still is not her thing. So pray that she complies with the doctor's request to rest and to reset and to heal. We want to be in prayer for George and Shirley Smith. I'll let you know last week that he was having, we've been praying for him for a couple weeks as he's gone on this health journey. Uh, and we got news that it is melanoma in his body and it is not, um, it's not good. And so uh, we want to pray for them as they make these decisions about his future care and all the decisions that, that go with that. We're still learning all the stuff and what the doctors are recommending. So we pray for both of them. Um, George is sometimes up in the tech booth too, and his mobility has decreased to the point that I don't think, I don't think we're going to get him back up there. Uh, so we just want to pray for all the losses that go with changes in the body and for them. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. <sighs> okay. That was a lot. I'm going to come down here and kneel and let's go to God with all of our prayers and all the prayers that remain unspoken that you carry in your hearts. Let's pray. God, your word calls us to rejoice always, to give thanks regardless of what else is going on. And so we begin there. We begin by giving thanks. We thank you for the breath that we take and the food that we eat and the fact that we're here in worship and we're, the fact that there's a place to worship, that there's a church building, that there's the internet, all the ways that we've connected to worship today. We thank you for that. And we thank you, God, just for being you, for being a God who is with us and who loves us so much. We rejoice, God, with loved ones, loved ones who are going into new schools, new opportunities, loved ones who are welcoming new life, who are starting new relationships. Help them to feel our rejoicing. Help them to in, just embrace these new starts well and to keep you at the center of all of these new things. But God, we also have loved ones that we're, we're anxious over. Loved ones with diagnoses that are not good. 
loved ones still struggling to find out a diagnosis, loved ones fighting addiction, loved ones seeking mental health care and physical health care. You, you know their names and you know their stories and you love them. Help us to trust that you love them. Raise up communities of love and support around them. Give them peace that passes understanding and circumstance. Help them to feel your presence walking with them every single step of the way. We pray for the communities that we call home, for the people and the leaders of the places we live, the places we work, the places our families and friends reside, the places we're from. Give their leaders wisdom and compassion. And we do pray for leaders around the world. Leaders who have the power and the ability to make decisions that dramatically change lives. We pray that they would not make those decisions out of selfishness or out of ignorance, but they would be filled with the best wisdom and the best knowledge we have available to us, that they would make decisions for the flourishing and the safety and the happiness of as many people as possible. God, we pray for this year, church and the church universal, that our actions and our words in this place and beyond this place would be filled with your love, that when people meet us and interact with us, they would realize how much you love them. And we thank you, God, for Jesus Christ, who shows us what it means to be a human after your own heart, who shows us what it means to follow you and obey you and live a faithful life even when things are challenging. We ask God for the courage and the boldness to be formed more fully in his image, to allow his life to take over our lives and as he taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Though the tears may fall, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. Though my heart may fail, my song will rise, my song will rise to you. While there's breath in my lungs, I will praise you, Lord. In the dead of night, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. When the waters rise, I'll lift my eyes, I'll lift my eyes to you. While there's hope in this heart, I will praise you. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When I cannot see you with my eyes, let faith arise to you. When I cannot feel your hand in mine, let faith arise to you. God of mercy and love, I will praise you. 
shine with glory, Lord of light, I feel alive with you. In your presence now I come alive, I am alive with you. There is strength when I say, I will praise you, Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy the joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. When sorrow comes my way, you are the shield around me. Always you remain like courage in the fight. Hear you call my name. Jesus, I am coming, walking on the waves, reaching for your light. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the darkness I'll dance, in the shadows I'll sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of love, we thank you that you have given us your word to read and to study and to know, to build our relationship with you and to hear the words that so many people have trusted in for so long. As we open up your word and turn to it today, may our hearts and minds be open to receive what you have for us today to be formed and shaped by your holy word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've come to the book of Ezekiel in the Bible year, and if I hope you're reading this book, because it's my favorite book in the Old Testament because it's just so weird. It is so weird. And every time I read it, I am grateful that I am not asked to preach to you the way Ezekiel is asked to do his sermons. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to crack this open and read it. It's bizarre. Just another little uh, fact to tease you with it if you haven't decided already to open it up. There are people out there who think Ezekiel saw aliens. So there you go. Our reading today is Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. It's one of Ezekiel's visions, and I will be reading from the Common English Bible. As I looked at the creature, suddenly there was a wheel on the earth corresponding to all four faces of the creatures. The appearance and composition of the wheels were like sparkling topaz. There was one shape for all four of them, as if one wheel were inside another. When they moved in any of the four directions, they moved without swerving. Their rims were tall and terrifying because all four of them were filled with eyes all around. When the creature moved, the wheels moved next to them. Whenever the creatures rose above the earth, the wheels also rose up. Whenever the wind, wherever the wind would appear to go, the wind would make them go there too. The wheels rose up beside them because the spirit of the creatures was in the wheels. When they moved, the wheels moved. When they stood still, the wheels stood still. And when they rose above the earth, the wheels rose up along with them because the spirit of the creatures was in the wheels. The shape above the heads of the creatures was a dome. It was like glittering eyes stretched out over their heads. Just below the dome, their outstretched wings touched each other. They each also had two wings to cover their bodies. Then I heard the sound of their wings when they moved forward. It was like the sound of mighty waters, like the sound of the Almighty, like the sound of tumult or the sound of an army camp. When they stood still, their wings came to rest. Then there was a sound from above the dome over their heads. They stood still and their wings came to rest. 
Above the dome over their heads, there appeared something like lapis lazuli in the form of Above the form of the throne, there was a form that looked like a human being. Above what looked like his waist, I saw something like gleaming amber, something like fire enclosing it all around. Below what looked like his waist, I saw something that appeared to be fire. Its brightness shone all around. Just as a rainbow lights up a cloud on a rainy day, so its brightness shone all around. This was how the form of the Lord's glory appeared. When I saw it, I fell on my face. I heard the sound of someone speaking. Here ends the reading. Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. When I was in seminary, and when I first came out of seminary and was doing all this continuing ed stuff, I went through the Lewis Fellows program, and I went through uh, the Academy for New Ministry Development, Everything that I went through taught us about, even uh, with Rebecca Simon Peter, when I went through creating a culture of renewal, everything in those programs taught us about the importance of crafting a vision for the church. Even to this day, when I get ready for my professional interviews, which I just had this last week, I have to fill out a pastoral profile. And one of the questions is, what is your process for visioning? How do you understand your role in the visioning process? That's how high of a premium they put on this concept. And what we learned, particularly through the Lewis Fellows program, is that in order to engage in a visioning process, you need a couple different pieces of information. The first circle of information is that you have to know the congregation. You have to listen to the people, know their stories, hear how they understand themselves and how, what their identity has been in the past. The second piece of information is knowing the strongest gifts and passions and resources of the congregation congregation have to offer. And then the third circle of information is the needs of the community. What does the community around the church need? What do they want? What is the the felt lack out there that could meet up? And then you draw this Venn diagram and your vision is supposed to hit that sweet spot where the three things overlap, right? Somehow you'll find a way where congregational identity and resources and the needs of the community all match up and then you, you produce this vision and in the words of Love at Weems, you know that you have the right vision when, when you speak it out loud and people in the room are like, yes, and they nod along with you. That was the big sign. How do you the vision of the church? People nod, yes. Well done, pastor, good job, right? That's what he told us to look up, that's what he told us to look for. Now Ezekiel has a vision. Ezekiel has a lot of visions in his text. And what was interesting is that a lot of his visions are, are weird, but the he's we have to remember who he's speaking to. So what's happening is that the people have found themselves outside of the land. They've been taken away from Jerusalem. They've been taken away from the temple. All of the tools that they used to worship were carried off by somebody else. Imagine if somebody came in here and stripped away all of the, the, our band instruments. We came in one day and they were just all gone, right? They've been carried off to be used by somebody else. People have no idea who they are now. Because remember, they lived in a time when the God they worshiped was attached to the land that they lived in. And if we're no longer land, if we're no longer near our temple, who are we? Who are we and how do we worship? Where is God now? And it is in the midst of this people that Ezekiel has his vision. Ezekiel is, we're told, carried to the people who are in exile. And when he gets there, God is already there with the people in exile. Where is God? God is in their midst. And then catch the description, right? Even in the midst of the weirdness, sometimes it's hard to muddle through the weirdness, but even in the midst of the weird description, notice that that there's wheels and creatures and a dome and a chair and God seems to be moving around almost in a super fancy power motor scooter like some people use when they go to the grocery store, right? God is mobile. 
God isn't just already in Babylon. God is equipped to keep moving wherever the people are. This is the base note of good news in Ezekiel's vision. And sometimes it's easy to forget it because so much of what Ezekiel is called to say to the people is not good, right? So much of the prophetic texts that we have preserved are not like hunky-dory. It's usually bad, it's bad news. It's usually bad news. But the base note of Ezekiel's vision is this good news that God is where the people are and God has been with them and God will continue to be with them even in the midst of this hard stuff that they're gonna go through. Now I told you we were taught to cast vision in the congregation. The hard news is that if you were to ask me where the church will be in five years, what the church will look like, I don't have an answer for you. Because we're in such a weird time. We've been moving towards this weird time as a nation for some time now. Ever since I got into ministry, I've heard stories about how the rising, the fastest growing religious identification on the U.S. Census is none. And that's been true for 15 years. It continues to be the fastest growing religious identification on the U.S. Census is, is none. And not only that, but so many of our foundational leaders and foundational members are getting older. Not to be too crass on you, but Lovett Williams called it the death tsunami. The death tsunami, because, and we're seeing it, right, in our pastors. We retire 30 pastors a year and we bring in six. So if you ask me where's the church going to be in five years, I can't answer that question for you. And it's really hard to admit that because I'm supposed to be able to give you a vision that makes you go, mm, yes, yes, that's where we're headed. A couple years ago, the conference insisted that all of the clergy read this book called Canoeing the Mountains. And it's this really interesting book about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, Lewis and Clark were tasked with exploring all this prop, all this land that Thomas Jefferson had acquired, right? All this stuff west of the uh, <laughs> Mississippi River. I almost forgot what river I was going to be talking about. All this stuff west of the Mississippi. And they made an assumption that they were going to hop in their little canoes and be able to just ride the river all the way out to the ocean. Doesn't work that way in this country, right? It doesn't work that way. Because eventually, as you move west, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Did I just go east? Nobody knows. Okay, west is that way, I gotta walk this way. Okay, thanks. I don't know what direction I'm facing. As you move west in this country, what do you eventually hit? Mountains, right? Guess what doesn't help you navigate a mountain? Canoes. They don't do anything. And so then Lewis and Clark are faced with this decision. Do we keep the canoes? Do we carry the canoes? How do we get over the mountains? Because my guess is Lewis and Clark had probably never seen mountains like the Rockies, right? The Appalachian Mountains are beautiful, but they are not the Rockies. How do we get over this? What does it mean? What's on the other side? And they're forced to make these decisions and all they have to go on is a vision and a purpose that's so broad and so vague that what, it, what it's telling them is we're just supposed to go look. We're supposed to keep walking until we hit some kind of ocean and figure out what's between here and there. And of course, the purpose of having us read this book was to encourage us to do what they call adaptive leadership, right? But I never really got it until now, until now, in this time of the church. What does the church look like in five years? I don't know. We might be crossing the Rockies right now. I don't know what kind of tools we need to take with us. I'm not sure how we're going to get from where we are to where we're going. I can't craft a vision that specific. I don't even know the specific needs of the community that we live in anymore because the global pandemic has changed us so very drastically. 
There are things I would love to talk about. I'd love to talk to you about giving. I'd love to talk to you about small groups. I'd love to talk to you about worship. And all those things will continue to be true because they are a part of who we are. But I don't know what any of those things will look like in five years. It may look like what it looks like now, or it may look like something completely different than what we're used to. Are we going to take the canoe with us, or do we need to leave the canoe here? I don't know. Ezekiel's base note of good news to the people who had been displaced, who didn't know where they were, who didn't know what it meant to worship in Babylon, his base note of good news was God is already here. Wherever, think, wherever you think you've been carried off to, wherever you think you've been displaced to, God is already here. Ezekiel didn't bring God to the people. God was already where the people are. And the vision that Ezekiel offers the people is a God that goes with them wherever they might go, whether it's staying in Babylon or eventually coming back to the vision for Broadway is the same. However church looks in five years, God will be there. God will be there and God will be with us. God is here in this room today. God is with those who are worshiping with us online. God is out in the world with people who don't even know God's name and who don't understand God to be a loving God like we understand God to be a loving God. And while I can't articulate right now the specific needs of the community, here's one thing I am sure of. Broadway has always had, or has had for a very long time, a statement that claims that we will be a place of unconditional love and acceptance. You heard a testimony earlier about the power of that unconditional love and acceptance. And that is that identity that predates me, predates Reverend Lynette and Pastor Chris and possibly Pastor Bob. That identity and understanding is absolutely something that the world needs to know. How does that look out in the world? I don't know. How do we communicate all of that? We're going to have to make it up as we go. We're going to have to figure out something to do with this canoe. But the world needs to know a God and a church of unconditional love and acceptance. And we need to step into that. One of the things that I did this last week is I met with a couple on Wednesday who had gotten almost as bad a news as any of us could imagine. Just devastating, world-changing, perspective-shifting news that no one ever wants to get. And I didn't even know they had gotten this news when I went to visit them. And when they told me the news they had received, I, I got ready. There are pastoral care things that we do. There are conversations that we're told to have. And so I was mentally preparing to have this conversation and this world-devastating, perspective-shifting news of theirs. They talked about it for approximately 10 minutes. And then you know what they wanted to talk about? They wanted to talk about you. They have a ministry that they're a part of that reaches out to the most vulnerable here in Council Bluffs, and they wanted to tell me how they were seeing a need rise in this ministry, and so they needed to find a way to make sure that this ministry was well-stocked and well-funded, and they wanted to tell me how proud they were of the volunteers that had stepped up and done so much in this ministry. And then they wanted to talk about donuts. They wanted to make sure that we had donuts and coffee this morning so that we could be in fellowship, so that nobody missed that because they weren't sure they would be able to help. That's the conversations they wanted to have. And when I left that couple and I was thinking about the church, I thought, man, if, if I had 50 of them, if I had people that were so sold out for serving God, so sold out for unconditional love and acceptance, that that's all they wanted to talk about. Not that we can't acknowledge our pain, not that we can't grieve when we get devastating news. I'm not trying to say we should ignore what we're going through. 
but a church full of people that just wanted to love and serve those around them. And I, I think I have it. But if we do more of that, then I can guarantee you that in five years the church will be here. The church will be here, it'll be filled with joy, it'll be filled with flourishing. It may not look exactly as it looks now, but people will be experiencing God's unconditional love and acceptance still through us, and they'll be hearing the good news that God has been with them this whole time. And I know, I know, I, I'm not allowed to gamble. I'm not very good at it the couple times I've tried it. Before I went into ministry, for any people listening, <laughs> But I would be willing to bet money, real money, that there is no one in this room that hasn't been touched by the work of this couple. And if that's true, if that's true, if, if you've ever experienced joy, if you've ever experienced acceptance and love, if you've ever been excited because someone was there to open the door for you here in the church, because they shook your hand, because they remembered your name, because they offered you help in a time of need, if that was ever true, then the call is not just to be grateful for the people that have been a source of joy in your life. The call is to be like those people for others around you, to live in to that reality as well. And if we are willing to do that, there will be a church in five years. That's the vision that I feel God calling us to today. And it's my prayer it's my prayer that we would all claim that vision and that we would live in such a way that God is here and God is there and God will be with us wherever we go and as long as we serve with all that we have, we have something very powerful to give. Amen? Because we are a church of unconditional love and acceptance, when we practice Holy Communion, we really believe that it is not Broadway United Methodist Church's table. It is Jesus Christ's table that we are gathered at. You do not have to be a member of this church or any church to participate in communion today. You merely have to be open to the reality that we believe Jesus Christ is here at this table with us. For those of you who are here with us physically present, if you choose to come forward, we have the communion elements put together in one cup. It's a rice cracker and some Welch's grape juice, so hopefully that makes it accessible to as many people as possible. You're welcome to take of both elements and then kneel at the communion rail if you want or return to your seats. There are buckets placed along the front row for you to put the cups once you're done partaking. For those of you joining us online, now is the time to have your elements. Whatever you found to use, we're going to join together in the great Thanksgiving. So will you join me? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to covering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. 
By the baptism of a suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and unfermented wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table is open. Come receive. Savior I felt fire from above I've been down to the river and I ain't the same prodigal just breaks a man breaks him down to his knees God I've been broken more than a time or two yes Lord he picked me up showed me what it means to be a man all my hope is in Jesus God, my yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. And 
I've been washed by the blood. Come on, you sing now. us, beloved. Will you stand to receive the blessing, please? That's not my prayer for all of us. I'm just grateful you stood. My prayer for all of us is that we would embrace the good news, that God is with us. God is with us in this place. God is with us wherever we go. God is with us in the future, that God has a plan and a purpose for us. What we're being asked to do is to be the unconditional love and acceptance here within these walls and out in the world. Go forth and be in the name and love and power of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Amen. Lift your head, weary sinner, sinner's just ahead. Down the path to forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You build a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls come crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. 